Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so uh, good morning. Thanks everyone for coming to Jan's talk. So probably many of you already know Jan because, uh, uh, because Jan was an uh, uh, intern here last summer. Um, and uh, so today Jan will talk uh, about his uh, thesis work, I guess. Um, so Jan has been doing research on probabilistic database as well as some, a number of algorithmic problems. And he has been publishing very well in top database conferences as well as con uh, algorithmic conferences. And I think uh, he won the 2009 VODB Best Paper Award. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Jan. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, so the title of my talk is Decision Making Under Uncertainty. So again, I'm, I'm Jian Li. So I'm a student at the University of Maryland. So can you hear me? OK. So I'm a student at the University of Maryland. So, so before, uh, before defining my problem, so, so I'm going to motivate the problem a little bit. So today, uncertain data is everywhere. It can be generated by many different systems, like data integration system or information extraction system, or it can be generated by a variety of reasons, for example, noise, errors, kind of stuff. So, so let me name a few applications here. So, so this is a data integration system. We have two different data sources, and we, we, we see two, two tuples here, one which has the same SSN number but different names. So one we were trying to integrate them into a single table, so we don't know which information is true. So we may as well just uh, put two tuples together and associate probability with 0 0.5 with, with each tuple. Okay. <coughs> so another application here is uh, the sensor network application. So the sensor measurement is accurate. So what we do is just use a Gaussian variable to model the sensor measurement. Okay. So just just a little few, uh, a few notation here. So so in this tuple, uh, in this in this example, so the, the the existence of a particular tuple is uncertain. So we call this tuple uncertainty. But in this example, each tuple, the existence of a tuple is certain, but the, the attribute value is uncertain. It's a random variable, so we call this attribute uncertainty. Okay. So another application here is the social network application. So we we extract the the information from the web, and we we we, we conclude some uh, some uh, friendship link, which sometimes is uncertain because we extract this information from web, from the conversation, or some tag of the picture. And um, another interesting, very interesting application here I, I want to talk about is this kidney exchange program. So we we have a a set of patients, and we have a set of donors, uh, kidney donors. And we want to find the matches between the donors and the, the patients. And what we have to do to determine a match between a patient and a donor is to run this cross-match test. And this test is uh, actually very expensive and time-consuming. So and ideally, so if we want to maximize the number of match matches, we have to run this cross-match test between all, all pairs of the donors and the patients. But actually, if what we do, if we use the estimation of the success probability by using some uh, easy to get information such as blood type, we can actually estimate the, the probability whether this two person uh, are a match. So we can use this information to minimize the number of, number of cross match tests and still get a very good matching. So, so this is where we can also use this probabilistic information. So another big source of info, uh, uncertain data is uh, the future data. Future data is definitely uncertain. So for example, t tomorrow's stock market or stock price is uncertain. So, so because this increasing volume of uncertain data generated every day, so there's an increasing need to analyze and uh, sort of reasoning over such data. So actually, it's to make, making decisions under uncertainty is not a new area. It's actually, it's a very old and broad area um, involved uh, many 
different disciplines. So, for example, economics and finance, they, 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 so they study problems, uh, uh, for example, to, to how to do investment under a certain future. And the probability theory or statistics, they give mathematic foundation to deal with such problems. Psychology study people's behavior under a certain future. And the last but not the least, uh, our computer scientists focus on the computational aspect of the problem in decision making and the uncertainty. Okay. So actually many different sub areas in computer science have interest in dealing with uncertain data, for example, networking and uh, machine learning. But in this talk, I'm going to stay in two topics. One is this probabilistic database. So in this domain, researchers are interested in design uh, to incorporate probabilities into relational table. And the people study the semantics and the algorithms to, uh, for the relational queries, such as uh, SQL query, top K query, or aggregate queries. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about the ranking and top K queries over probabilistic database. So another area I'm going to talk about is stochastic optimization for combinatorial problems. And there are a number of very um, uh, well-studied models. For example, there's two-stage stochastic optimization or some sort of online stochastic optimization. So in this, but in this talk, I'm going to define a new class of problem. So, so uh, we, we call expected utility maximization problem. I will motivate this problem a little bit later. So if time allows, I'm going to talk about stochastic matching problem, which has application, interesting application in online dating and the, the, also the kidney exchange pro program I, I, I just talked about. OK. So if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. Okay. So just to uh, review a little bit about the probabilistic data database. So, so, so the general goal is to manage probabilistic data and support a declarative language uh, query processing. So, so currently, there are actually many probabilistic database prototypes nowadays. We can see there are quite a number of them. And the, 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 the problem I'm going to talk about belongs to this ProDB project developed at the Uni University of Maryland. And uh, so our general goal is, again, to, to support the ranking and top K queries over probabilistic data database, which has a number of applications. And uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about this possible word semantic, which is uh, the most popular semantics to do query processing over probabilistic database. Again, suppose, for example, we have this uh, probabilistic table here. We have three tuples. And the, for each tuple, we associate it with a probability so we assume this is a tuple uncertainty model. So with probably 0.2, this tuple exists. With probably 0.8, this tuple doesn't exist. Okay. <coughs> so we assume that uh, all the tuples are independent of each other. So again, this, this single probabilistic table actually corresponds to a class of deterministic table. So each deterministic table can be thought as the outcome of this probabilistic table. So, so we call each deterministic table a possible word. So I'm going to use this word, possible word. So, so basically, a probabilistic table can be thought as a, a probability distribution over possible words. OK? So if we do query processing um, over such probabilistic database, it's, it's equivalent to issue, issuing the same query over this class of possible words. So suppose we, we, we are trying to answer the top top k query, so suppose top one answer, so which tuple we should return to the user. So, so what we do is just uh, issue the top one answer for each possible word. So we see actually we, we return different answers for different possible words. So what we get is the probability di distribution of different answers. So but we, the user only wants one tuple, so which one should we return? So we have to have some uh, systematic way to combine those different answers, which is a probability probability distribution of different answers. OK, so again, so, so, so just one thing to note here, we have, a, for simplicity, we have a score value which is used to, to, to rank the tuple in a deterministic setting, OK? So, so actually, this is not an easy problem, and there are 
a number of prior work on this. So, so the simplest one is just to return the k-tuples with the uh, highest expected score, which is defined to be the score times the probability. Okay, this is the expected score. And uh, so the researchers have found this is actually a not very good criterion to do top k. And later on, Solima et al., the ICD proposed two different uh, semantics, u top k and u run k. So the u top k returns the most probable top k answer. And the u run k, what they do is at your position rank i, they return the tuple with the largest probability to be a rank i answer. Okay? So another one is this probabilistic threshold top k answer. So they return k tuples with this the largest this probability. This probability is the rank of this tuple is less than k, which means this tuple is a top k answer. And it returns those tuples with the largest probability of a, being a top k answer. And there are some few others. So, so what I want to say here is we have many different top k semantics, and uh, each of them seems I mean, very natural. You see with most probable and the largest probability. So which one? we are going to use. So, so in order to address this question, uh, okay, so, so, so let me just uh, give you a very simple example and the answer is uh, the question which one should we use, okay? So, so let, let's uh, take this uh, probabilistic threshold top k answer for, for example. And so we return k tuples with the largest uh, probability that this tuple being at the top, being at the top k answer. Okay, so, so this is a probabilistic table here we have. This is a probability of existence. And this, two, th this table corresponds to eight possible words. So each possible word corresponds to a subset of tuples. And this, we have to compute these probability values for each tuple. So we have three tuples, we compute the probability value here. So for example, for T3, so uh, suppose k equal to two, okay, k equal to two, and then let's compute the probability for T3. So this probability comes from these three possible words. So in these three possible words, T3 is the top two answer. So we just sum up all these probabilities and we get this probability. Then we rank according to this probability. So again, so, 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 so one, one question is, uh, is so, <coughs> so in order to compute this probability, we have to I mean, sum up some probability of, of possible word. But if there are many tuples, the number of possible word is ex exponential, we have to ha have a more efficient uh, algorithm to estimate this probability, right? So th this is an algorithmic challenge here. And uh, let's return to the question. I mean, there are many uh, uh, top k ranking functions. Which one should we use? So in order to, to answer this question, let's, let's use a, use a, a normal like this normalize the Kendall distance between two top k answers to, to, to measure the similarity of, to measure the dissimilarity of two top k answers. So, so if, if all of those ranking functions returns very similar top k answers, so we may as well use any of them. So if they, they return a very different answer, so, 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 so there must be some other problems. So, so we use this Kendall distance between two top k answers. Basically, this distance is between zero and, zero and one. So if it's zero, means two, two answers are the same. If it's one, means two answers are disjoint. So let's look at this two table here. So th they are computed from two different data sets. This is from the real data set, which has one million tuples. And this, this, those are the different ranking functions, at least in the previous slides. And the number here means the distance, the Kendall distance of two top K answers, one is obtained by using this ranking function while it's obtained by using this ranking function, okay? So we can see the number here. So the small number means two, two top k answers are very similar. But we can see those, those numbers are very close to one, which means that the answers are pretty much disjoint. And if, if let's see this table here, which is quite different from this ta table, so we can see that this, this expected rank is quite close to expected score. This number is very small but both of them are quite different from the, the, the rest of the ranking functions. So, so, so we conclude actually those ranking functions return drastically different answer. So there, there must be something wrong. So what do we do? Actually, so, what, 
So our proposal is actually, so different users may have different preference, and this different preference may, may imply different, uh, <coughs> different ranking functions. So therefore, <coughs> therefore we define this parameterized ranking function, which, uh, so we, we are going to define two class of parameterized ranking function, PRFW and PRFE, and which can be controlled by the parameter. When we change different parameter, uh, change the parameter, it can achieve different user preference. And also this parameterized ranking function generalizes most of the previous ranking functions. Okay, so we'll see why is that later. Okay, so again, so one thing to note is this PRFE is much more efficient to evaluate. So here is our overall um, framework here. So we start from the user. So, so if the user knows which ranking function to use, so the user has a particular preference. So if this user knows which ranking function to use, so in some cases, this ranking function is a special case of the PRFW function. So we just represent it as the PRFW function with a particular parameter. So in some cases, the user have no idea which ranking function to use. So we, we instead gave this user a very small table and let this user to, to rank this very small table. And we can actually learn the, use a learning algorithm to learn the parameters from this sample and derive a PRFW function with a particular parameter. So we can learn the parameters from this sample. And then we can actually compute, uh, use this PRFW function to rank the tuple, uh, to, to, to rank this table, to rank those tuples. And if we feel those, uh, it's not uh, efficient enough, we can use PRFE to approximate. So just to recall PRFE can be evaluate much more efficiently, okay. 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 So now let's let's see the formal definition of our parameterized ranking function PRF. So this is a PRFW function. So the parameter is a weight function. This weight function is mapping a rank to a possibly complex number. So a rank is an integer one, two, three, four, five, and the, the, this uh, so a PRF function for a particular tuple is defined to be the a linear combination of the, the, the weight function weighted by the positional probability. So what's the positional probability? So this is, a pr this is a probability that this particular tuple, the rank of this particular tuple is i. So this is a probability, okay? So we just use this linear function. And the, the second parameterized function is PRFE function, which is a special case of PRFW. So here the, P, the, the weight function is just a exponential function. It's just an ex exponential function. R this alpha is a parameter which can be a real number or a complex number. Okay, so this is again a linear sum of this weight function which is an exponential function. Then we compute those PRF value for each tuple and we rank those tuple by the highest this, this value. So because it can be a complex number, so we take absolute value here. Okay, to, to see wh whether, why it's, to generalize some other ranking functions. So for example, if this weight function is one, so if this weight function is one with some summation over all the po positional probability, which is the existence probability. Okay, so we just rank those tuples by the existence probability. <coughs> so this is a very special case. So, so another example here, so if the weight function is one for if the weight is between one and the k, so which means the the rank of this tuple is uh, top k. So this is a PTK we just discussed, which we rank the tuple by the probability of this tuple being at rank k. Okay, so it also generalizes other uh, ranking functions. Uh, so I'm not going into the detail here. <clears throat> so, so now let's see the, our algorithm to evaluate this. So, so one thing to note, recall that we, we cannot evaluated by listing all the possible word because there might be exponential number of possible word. So, uh, <coughs> so instead of discussing the... Uh, so, can I go back to the earlier? Can you go back to the earlier? So because a weight function is a function of i alone, uh, the rank. Mm -hmm. So how do you do anything that is a function of a score value? It can, can incorporate the score because it, it, this weight function can, uh, I mean, can incorporate the score. This weight function can be a function of score and the rank. So, so this doesn't affect the, the, the evaluation algorithm. Actually, it's not going to be a problem, but to, just for simplicity, I didn't discuss it. Okay. 
So, so, so instead of discussing how to compute PR function directly, I'm going to propose a more, more, much more general framework. And this more general framework can compute a variety of different kind of probabilities over, uh, over this, probability, uh, this, this uh, probabilistic database model, which we call probabilistic NL tree. So this probabilistic NL tree can capture two types of correlation. One is uh, mutual exclusivity and uh, one's coexistence. So let's consider this uh, example here. So, so those leaves of this tree are the possible tuples here. So this is a key of the tuple, this is a score of the tuple. Okay, key is score. Those are the tuples. And this XOR, node, XOR captures the mutual exclusivity. So this XOR node means at, uh, at most one tuple can exist in this subtree. So these are probabilities, which means with probability 0.5, this tuple exists. With probability 0.3, this tuple exists. With probability 0.2, nothing exists. And this N node here means the coexistence. So the result of this three XOR node coexist, okay? So for example, we have this possible word, this 3150. So what's the probability this exists? That is the probability that nothing in this subtree exists, which is this probability, and nothing in this subtree exists, this, this probability, and this tuple itself exists, okay? This is the probability. So, so in general, this probabilistic NL tree can have more levels, more than two levels, okay? So, and the one thing to note is this generalized, this X-tuple model. This is a widely used model before, which can only capture mutual exclusivity. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's wrong? Okay. Okay, so, so to compute the, the, the I said that I, I would introduce a framework to compute a variety of probabilities. So what we do is, to use this generating function method. So in general, a generating function is a, a, a polynomial. And the, we say this generating function generates a particular sequence if the coefficient of this polynomial are the numbers of, uh, of the, the, the sequence we are going to generate. So, so what we do is for, for each leaf of that tree, we associate each leaf with uh, some variable x, y, or z. So, okay. so this, is, this is a construction of the generating function. I'm, I'm going to tell you so what's the result later. So for an end node, the generating function for this end node is the product of the generating function for its, its, its leaves. Uh, for an XOR node, the generating function is this probability times this, this generating function, probability times this, plus probability times this generating function. And the plus Q, Q is the rest of the probability. The probability nothing in this subtree exists, okay? And we construct this generating function bottom up and at the root node, we also have a generating function, all right? Which this, this, the, those variables are the variables we associated with the leaves. And we expand this generating function, we got a, a, uh, sum, uh, a summation of monomials, and these are the coefficients, and these are the monomials, okay? And the, the, the theorem here is the, the coefficient of C, the coefficient CIG of the term x to the power of i by to the power of g, there might be more variables, which this, this coefficient is the probability of all the possible words which have i tuples we associated with variable x and the y tuple, j tuples we associated with variable y. So this is the whole probability that with this many x, with this many y. So, so is this clear? So is there any questions? Okay. Okay, therefore, so, so let's, 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 let's look at an example here. So the example here, let's say we want to compute the probability distribution of the size of the possible word, okay? So what we do is just we associate all the leaves with variable x. So because we want to compute the number of, uh, number of tuples in this possible world. So then we construct the uh, generating function this times this plus this times this plus 0 0.2 and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, at the root we have this generating function and th this generating function we expand this generating function to standard form and the coefficient will be the probability distribution of the possible world. Okay. Okay, so, so this is one simple application of the theorem. 
and then I'm going to talk about the, how to compute the positional probability. So if we can compute the positional probability, we can evaluate the PR function, right? Because the PR function is defined to be the linear sum of the positional probability. Okay, so, so let's see, let's, let's look at this example here. So we want to compute the uh, positional probability for T4. And so one thing to note that the, uh, the, the rank of the tuple i is, being at, is, is j if and only if there are j minus one tuples with higher score exist and this tuple itself exists, right? So which, for example, T4, okay. So then the construction here is for T4, we give, we associate with, with variable y. And for all the tuples which has a higher score, we associate with variable x. And for all the tuples with lower score, we associate with just one. So therefore, if we compute the positional probabilities, and the positional probability of T4 is going to be the coefficient of, uh, if this is j, this is going to be x power to the power of j minus one, y. So why is this? Uh, so this means there are j minus one tuples with higher score exist. And y means this tuple T4 itself exists. Okay? So therefore we can, we have this, uh, this generative function with two variables and we expand this generative function and we got those positional probabilities and in turn we can compute the PRF score. And this can be all done in polynomial time for sure. And it's actually quite fast. We can do this in order uh, in, in square time. And we have some, uh, some here other results here. So this is a summary of the result. The summary of the result, uh, we, we have PRFW function for independent tuples. So actually, in order to achieve all this result, we need some tricks to do the polynomial multiplication for which we can use the FFT algorithm to do polynomial multiplication. And we have to use some other tricks to, to further reduce the running time. So this is the result we get. So this is a H plus log n, so h, h is a parameter here. So, uh, and this is a previous result for very special case. Recall that it's u rank and the ptk are special cases of our PR function. And we actually, this is our reading time is better than the previous one. And uh, for, for n or tree, so this d, d is the height of the tree, it's the number of levels of that tree. And previous results are only for very special cases for u rank k over x tuples. So our result is uh, a PR for n or trees, which is more general than x tuples. And this is the PTK for x tuples. And they got n square h, this n square h, n square h. We have actually, if d is equal to two, we got n h, which is almost linear, right? So this is uh, square, this, we, we got linear. So, <coughs> So for PRFE, we can have, actually have more efficient algorithms. So basically for independ independent tuples, we have a log n, and then our trace, we have nd plus n log n. So if, if, the, if we have x tuples we have d equal to two, we have basically a log n. So which is the same as ranking in deterministic table. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Oh, h h is a h is a parameter here. So h, uh, I, I, I may I may forget to say that. So h is a so recall we, the, the for PFW function we have this weight function which which maps the rank to a to a number, and h is a parameter that if the rank is larger than h, then this function is zero. Okay. Uh, I forgot to say that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, so, so from last slides, we know that PRFE function is particularly easy to 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 evaluate. It can be evaluated in log n time. So, uh, presumably, we, we would like to to rank using PRFE. But if the user really want to rank by uh, using a PRFW, so what we do is actually we can approximate PRFW by a linear combination of PRFE. So, what we do here is suppose we can write a weight function 
as the as the following as a linear combination of exponential functions. So this is a weight function. This is a linear combination of ex exponential functions. Then this is a PRFW, uh, a PRFW def definition of PRFW, which is a linear combination of the position, this weight function. So if we plug this in, we see actually this is a linear combination of PRFE function. So so in the bracket we have a PRFE function. The weight is an exponential function. Therefore, we can evaluate this. So previously we have n squared time to evaluate this. Now we actually have a an L algorithm to, to, to evaluate this because we have L PRFE function to evaluate. Then we sum it up to get this. Right? Okay, so 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 the, the only thing that we need to do is we actually need to decompose this. Uh, uh, weight function into a linear combination of uh, uh, exponential function. In order to do this, we use an analog of the discrete Fourier transformation. We, we, make, we made some modification to this to achieve this goal, and it works pretty well for, for reason, reasonably smooth weight function. Okay. Make the Fourier transform. Yes, yes, that's the reason, yeah. We need we need complex numbers, yeah. So I'm going to show you so first some experiments some experimental result here. <coughs> so recall the, the for the PRFE function we have only one single parameter. So I'm going to show if we change this parameter from zero to one, actually this a single PRFE function I can actually approximate many other ranking functions. Okay, so, so we still use Kendall distance as a measurement. And uh, here for each curve correspond to a particular ranking function. And the x axis corresponding to the parameter alpha, the single parameter alpha. Because of scale problem, we use a function of alpha here. i is a function of alpha. But essentially it's changing alpha from one, uh, from zero to one, essentially, okay? So we can see each curve so each point here is the uh, handout distance between two top k answer. One is obtained by the, the uh, by the ranking function, and the, the other one is obtained by the PRFE function with that parameter. Okay, okay. So we can see for each curve, each curve is like this shape, the, this uni valley shape. First decrease and then increase. So what does this mean? This means at the bottom point. So there is a point that the PR the PRFE function with that parameter can approximate that ranking function. Okay, we can see for each, each curve there is a lowest point, and this point is pretty low. The Kendall distance is very small. Okay, so th that means there is a, there is a par uh, PRFE function with a particular parameter that can approximate that ranking function. Okay, and then otherwise, uh, <coughs> This figure shows uh, we use a linear combination of PRFE function to approximate the PRFW function. Okay, so this is the number of terms. I'll recall we decompose a weight, weight function to a linear. Uh, so. uh, sorry, just going back to your, your earlier thing. So does the setting of this parameter that I need in order to approximate a given ranking function, mm -hmm. to which degree does that depend on the specific data set you're using? To which, um, it actually depends on the data set. So you can sort of set that once and for all and then... Yeah, yeah we cannot do that. But to, what we can do actually for this particular, uh, for this particular application, we can, we can actually sample some data from the original data and estimate the parameter here then. Yeah. And the, the second figure here, so, so this is a number of terms. So recall we decompose a weight function into a linear combination of uh, exponential function, and this is the number of terms. As the term increase, we can see the Kendall distance be become smaller and smaller. So, even the number of terms is like 20 or 30, the Kendall distance is already pretty low. It's pretty below zero than 0 0.1. Uh, so, so this means if we use 30 n times uh, running time is 30 n, we can achieve pretty good uh, performance. And this two figures show some running time here. This is the previous, the previous algorithm like U rank, like PTK, and this is a PRFE function, which is pretty fast here. 
And this is an uh, approximation versus the exact algorithm. This is a, the, uh, the exact algorithm which takes a pretty long time. And if we use approximation, the linear combination of PRP function, which is uh, much faster, much, much faster. OK. OK, so I'm going to show you some other results uh, here. So, so I discussed this. Uh, so the algorithm I discussed uh, only works for for discrete uh, uh, probability distribution. So for the, for the continuous distribution, we have to do something more. Actually, this is a generating function we are going to use. I'm not going to tell you why we use this generating function. But you can see we have this integral here. And the, in order to evaluate this integral, we need some numerical method. And uh, actually, so use this generative function method, we got some polynomial time algorithm for uniform distributions and the piecewise polynomial distribution. So if the distribution can be written as a piecewise polynomial, so each piece can be represented as a polynomial, so we can have a polyno polynomial time algorithm. So, so in general, uh, arbitrary distribution, we cannot hope for an exact algorithm. So, but uh, instead, we, um, we have an approximation scheme for arbitrary distribution. And we can show that this, our scheme uh, converge much faster than, the, for example, Monte Carlo or some other uh, straightforward method. Converge much faster. OK. So, um, so uh, I'm going to speak, uh, uh, return to the original um, the, the query processing over probabilistic database. So, so again, so recall that a uh, single probabilistic table corresponds to a, a probability distribution of uh, possible words. So if we do query processing on that, so we have to have some systematic way to combine those different answers coming from d different possible words. So here is one, uh, one, one proposal here, so we call consensus answer. So what we do in this scenario is, so, uh, so recall we have a collection of possible words, and each possible word may return different answers. So we think each different answer as a point in some space, as a point in some space. And we gave uh, some metric of this space, some distance function to this space. And this, di this distance function between two points measure whether these two, two answers are similar or dissimilar. So if the, the distance is small, it means these two answers are similar, OK? And we define the consensus answer to be a single point in this space, which is a single answer, which minimizes the following, which has the minimal expected distance to the rest of the answer. OK? So this is a distance, the distance I just talked about. This answer minimizes the, 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 answer, uh, the distance from this answer to the other possible answers. OK, so we call this consensus answer. OK, so, and this, this single, uh, this, this single point consensus answer can be thought of the, the, the centroid or the center of mass of this, uh, this set of possible answers, OK? So, and, the, and we use this, this idea, this consensus answer, to, 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 uh, to give semantics for, for different queries in probabilistic database. And in particular, if we apply this, this idea to the top kick answer, so actually, we can show that the, the PTK, the probability threshold I gave, the, the, which is the example I gave you in the beginning, which is actually the consensus top K answer under this distance function. The distance function is symmetric difference, which is uh, the, the number of tuples. We have two top K answers. This measures the number of tuples that are in exactly one top K answer, but not both. Okay. So therefore, if it's zero, means two two. Two answers are completely destroyed. Uh, uh, I'd say uh, maybe it's the reverse. Okay, so more generally, we have PFW function, which is equivalent to the consensus answer over the weighted symmetric di difference. The weighted symmetric difference is generalized the symmetric di difference in a way that we gave more weight for higher positions. Okay. So actually, we actually have some other result for the Jacquard distance and the Spearman foot rule, Kendall's tau distance, which also measures the similarity between two top k answers. Okay, and we also 
have some other result for aggregate queries or clustering. I mean, it's a pretty general framework we can apply to different type of queries. And now let's come to the second part of my talk, which I want to discuss the stochastic optimization for combinatorial problems. Okay. <clears throat> so, so one thing we w I want to note is that uh, so far most of the work on this domain have focused on optimize the expected value of the uh, of some objective. For example, uh, maximize the expected profit or minimize the expected cost or something similar. But to we, so so my argument is sometimes the expected value is not a very good criterion here. So it's not, a, it's especially in some cases where we want to capture the risk of worse and the risk of prone behavior. So, so let me give you an example here. So, so suppose we have two, two, two actions. One action is I give you $100. So the action two is I give you $200 with probability one half and I give you nothing with probability one half. So, um, so the, both actions have the same expected value, right? It's easy to see it's 100. But the risk of worse user usually prefer action one to action two. And the risk prone user prefer action two. So why is that? Because a gambler would like to spend $100 in order to play double or nothing. This corresponds to double or nothing. This corresponds to spend $100, which means risk prone user prefer action two, right? So that means um, expected value cannot differentiate this two action, okay? So and, uh, this is a very simple example. A more extreme and uh, but more interesting example is this Shint Pittsburgh paradox. Okay, so th th in this paradox, it's a game. So so you uh, you you, g so you spend X dollars to enter this game, and in this game, what you do is repeatedly toss a fire queen, until the tail appears, and you got some payoff. The payoff is two to the k, where k is number of heads. So because you always gain some money from this game, so you you have to pay to play. Otherwise, you always gain, right? You have to pay something to play. So how much you should pay? So, so if we use expected value criterion to see, so this, the value you should pay should be the expected payoff, right? If the, if the payment is less than expected payoff, you should play. So the expected payoff turns out to be, this is one times one half, so not no heads. So only one head, uh, there's no heads appeared. And this is only one heads appeared, two heads appeared, right? So if you summation over all this, you find this is the infinity, which means no matter how much you pay, you should play. You should always play this because the expected payoff is the infinity. So, but actually, economists and the psychologists done extensive survey and find actually few people would like even pay twenty-five dollars for that. I mean, what 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 does twenty-five dollars means? Which means you you should ha get at least four heads or f five heads, right? which is uh, actually happen with pretty small probability. People are smart, and the, the people don't behave according to expected value. So this means actually there's, there's a huge gap between expected value and what people be behavior. So actually to address this question, so we, we, we propose to, to optimize another more general function which we call the utility function. So a utility function maps a profit to a utility value. So utility measures your, your satisfaction. So and the expected utility maximization pr principle says the decision makers will always maximize the expected utility. So a particular user have a particular preference which implies a particular utility function. So again, let's see so why it can capture this. This can capture the risk of worse and risk prone behavior, okay? So we have two, uh, so, so in this two example, we have this risk of worse behavior, which corresponds to, to this concave utility function. So this concave utility function, the derivative is decreasing, and uh, so this is a decreasing marginal utility, so which is typical risk of worse behavior. So let's see, we have two actions with just the example we had. So, so let's see what's action one. So the action one here is $100, and the, the expected utility here is, is this, this point, right? So this, is a, this maps this utility, expected utility. And the, the action two is $200 with 0, 0 0.5 probability and zero, prob, uh, $0 with 
probably 0 0.5, which is the midpoint of this two point, which is this is action two, expected utility of action, action two. So this means the expected utility of action one is larger than expected utility of action two. So which, again, um, is consistent with the risk of worse behavior. And this is risk prone behavior, which is exactly the opposite. And the, actually, <coughs> So um, actually, if we design careful, um, carefully the, the utility function, we can address the strength Pittsburgh paradox. So the, the another nice thing about this expected utility maximization principle is that von Neumann and Morgenstern gave a axiomatization anx of this principle. So what they do is they, they gave various three basic axioms about user preference. So very three very three three very simple statement of user preference, and they can actually deduce this principle rigorously, mathematically. Okay. So, so now let's, let's just apply this expected utility maximization principle to see to, to, to the combinatorial problem. So the, the, the type of combinatorial problem we're going to discuss is a fairly general model here. We have, a, suppose we have a set of elements. Each element have a weight. So in a, de in a deterministic setting, and the solution is going to be a subset of those elements satisfy some property. So if we, have, we want to find a path, those, element, those edges should form a path. If we want to find a spanning tree, those elements should form a spanning tree. It's just a subset of uh, elements. And the goal is to, to, to minimize, uh, right, to minimize the, the, the total, total weight in a deterministic setting. So in a stochastic setting, so where we have probability, we have this weight is going to be a positive random variable. It's not a deterministic value anymore. So, and again, we, we, because we have a utility function, which is also given, utility function. So, because of the problem is trying to minimize the, the objective, so we assume the utility function is sort of decreasing. So if the weight, weight is very large, the utility is very low. You get very little utility. And the, and uh, we assume that uh, this utility function goes to, uh, goes to zero if uh, the value goes to infinity. And we want to maximize the expected utility. Okay. Okay. So this is the general theorem we got. Uh, okay. So this is the general theorem we got. So suppose the following two conditions holds. Okay, so the first condition is there's a pseudo random pseudo polynomial time algorithm for the exact version of the deterministic problem. So I'm going to explain. So exact version means we are not trying to op optimize, our, um, optimize any object. We just want to find a solution of a p exact weight k. k is a given, given value. So we want to find a solution with exactly this value, not to optimize anything. And pseudo polynomial time means this algorithm running in polynomial in k, not in the size of the input. And uh, another thing, condition is if the utility function satisfies this holder condition. So you don't have to see this. So you just re remember that this holder condition means this function is fairly smooth. And it's, it's continuous and fairly smooth. That's OK. Then we can actually have a polynomial time algorithm that can find, uh, optimize this expected utility up to an absolute addictive error for any arbitrarily small Absolute. Okay. And this is a. Uh, this is our result. Actually, there are many uh, deterministic problems satisfied this condition one, top k correlation, shortest pass, minimal spanning tree matching, and so on and so forth. And our theorem can apply to all of this. And actually, our theorem can actually generalize uh, many previous results. Generalize many previous results. So one. So, so, so one problem is this stochastic path problem. So we have a network. We have a network, and each edge is, uh, has a weight, which is uh, actually uh, which is uncertain. It's a random variable. And we want to find a path in this network. And we want to maximize the, weight, the probability that this path is less than something. So OK, and we want to find such, such a path. And these are some previous results. They got some approximation for 
for some particular distribution. So if the weights are normally distributed or exponential distributed, and in our result we give, I mean, in general, uh, approximation for any distribution. For any distribution, we don't care which distribution. So, okay. So, so one thing to note that we, why optimizing this probability is just can be can be captured by optimizing a utility function. So we just take this utility function. This step utility function actually is this same as this probability. Okay. So, so I'm not going into the detail here. So that actually, another application of our theorem is stochastic knapsack problem. So, so in this problem, we have a set of elements. We have a set of elements where we want to put in a knapsack with a particular capacity, and each element has a profit and a size. The size is uncertain. So we want to make sure that the probability that those elements fit into this knapsack is large enough. And these are some pre previous results. We have logarithmic approximation or for some particular distribution. And our result gave a, a general uh, approximation up to arbitrary close error for any distribution. And actually our algorithm is quite simple. So I'm not going into the detail of the algorithm, but it's actually quite simple. The analysis is also quite simple. OK, so I'm not going to this. So I think the last part I want to discuss is the, the, the problem formulation for the kidney exchange program I discussed in the beginning. So this is a stochastic matching problem. The stochastic matching problem where we have, it has an interesting application also in the online dating system. So I'm going to discuss soon. So the, 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 the problem formulation for this is we, we are given a probabilistic graph. So the edge, the existence of each edge is not, it's not certain. So it happened, this edge exists with certain probabilities. And for each vertex, we also have a patient's level, which is an integer, one, two, three, four, five, something like that. And what we can do, we want to find a matching in general. We want to find a large matching. And what we can do is we probe those edges. We probe this edge, and we will know whether this edge exists or not. It exists with probability PE, and doesn't exist with probability one minus PE. And if this edge exists, we have to take this edge into our matching. And if this edge doesn't exist, so we, de we decrease the patient's level of both end vertices by one. So we decrease the patient's level of both end vertices by one. So, so the objective is to find a, to find a strategy to, to probe those edges and find a large matching. Okay. So, so, so there's this, 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 this. Expected weight of the matching. So, um, so in general, we can have a weight for each edge. And so we'll it's the sum of the weights of the edges that are in the matching. Yeah, in the matching. Okay. So, so, so this problem was proposed uh, previously by Chen et al., where they solved the, uh, un, where they solved the unweighted, uh, unweighted version. Unweighted version with all the edges has weight 1, which is the cardinality of the matching. So in this, case, in this paper, we gave a, a, con a good approximation for the weighted version which generalized this. So this, this resolve open question proposed in the previous problem. So, so let's not discuss the result, but let's motivate this problem. So why we are at all interested in this problem? So actually, this, there's a very interesting application in online dating. So, so we have a bunch of people logging into the, this online dating system. We can think each person as a point, and each edge is a match between these two persons. And we have this existence probability, which can be, uh, this, this existence probability of an edge can be estimated by this, this profile. So user log into this uh, online dating system and uh, input some personal information. And the, the, the online dating system can based, use this personal information to compute whether these two person match or not. And they give some probability. And this is, a, this, this will use the existence probability to capture this. And what's the probing of this edge? So what we can probe each edge correspond to, we actually send this two person to a particular, to, to an actual date. So, so an actual date which can result two outcomes. One is this edge exists, which means these two person are, are matched. And the other 
outcome is this that doesn't exist and the, the, the date didn't end up well. And the, the, the patient's level, again, for each vertex, we have a patient's level. So, so the dish models, if a particular person experienced too many failed dates, that it, uh, he or she will eventually quit this online dating system. And uh, this on, the goal of this online dating system is to find a particular problem strategy to, 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 to maximize the, the the, the, the weight of the matching, okay? So actually this has some other applications, you know, the kidney exchange and the online AdWord assignment problem. In both applications, we want to find a large matching on an uncertain scenario, okay? So this is uh, pretty much all I want to see. So, uh, so I guess I'm not going to talk about this, some, just some future work. So. <coughs> Just some future work. Um, so the first future work is for the expected utility maximization. So I discussed a very general theorem, but it's still not qu quite general enough because the condition one required that the, pro the, 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 the deterministic version of the problem has a pseudo polynomial time algorithm, but to, for strong NP hard problems, so what, what can we do? So for example, vertex cover, standard tree, and for other gen uh, general uh, aggregate function, what can we do? So, so this is uh, one future work. And another future work is, I mean, the, uh, the psychologist, uh, the, especially Kahneman and Worski find out sometimes pe people behave even deviate from the expected utility theory. Sometimes uh, people can be both risk averse and risk prone. And uh, to capture this really, I mean, weird um, preference, you need a very general uh, theory. They, they, they propose this pro prospect theory, which, uh, for which they, 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 they obtained this uh, Nobel Prize for, for this work. And this is a more general uh, framework. And um, this may have some implication in our particular computational problem, which I don't know, it's uh, future work. And another future work is ranking in the a more complicated scenario, for example, so, so the PR function I just discussed, uh, one PR function can address one particular user preference, but uh, if the system has m many users, uh, uh, has many users, we should uh, address a sort of aggregate preference. And sometimes there are a very classic example here, so, so the, the Jagger means, um, two different things for different persons, so, uh, which means different persons have different preference, which we should address them simultaneously. And this leads to the, the, the term of diversification of the ranking result, which means in the top result, we should make this, those results diversified. Uh, and there are some models for this, and uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything that, that I can do here to incorporate the uncertainty into those models. There are some, some uh, theoretical mod models here. So this is, uh, I guess this is all I want to see. Uh, I want to say. Okay, thanks. So you mentioned earlier on that uh, that you, you can learn the ranking function from examples, from using yeah. examples, can you explain? So that? actually the, the, there are some, because our ranking function is a linear function, a linear function, a, a, a linear function of the weight function. So the weight, we want to learn the weight, which is the parameters. Actually there are some, uh, the, the SVM rank can do this task. And there are some other ranking function, uh, le learning functions can learn the linear weight. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess if we don't have questions, I uh, said uh, thanks to speak again. Okay.